Thank you all so much for joining us today. We'll be getting started with the webinar in just a moment. Welcome everyone. On behalf of NIOSH supported education and research centers throughout the country, we are pleased to present the 2020 Industrial Hygiene Webinar Series, offering free webinars the second Tuesday of each month. This collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's webinar, Respiratory Exposures and Outcomes Among Cannabis Workers, is brought to you by the Northwest Center for Occupational Health and Safety and Dr. Christopher Simpson. A few housekeeping items first. You will be muted during this presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please enter it into the online chat or Q&A. We will save time at the end of the presentation to address all questions. Learners who participate in the full live webinar today will be eligible to receive a certificate of completion. You'll receive a follow-up email tomorrow, March 11th, with a link to the online evaluation. Once you complete the online evaluation, you will be able to access your certificate. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the COEH Northern California's YouTube page and on our website. At this time, we're pleased to welcome our presenter, Dr. Christopher Simpson. He is a professor in exposure science at the School of Public Health, Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Washington. Dr. Simpson's research interests involve the application of analytical chemistry to the development of techniques for assessment of exposure to toxic chemicals and the subsequent application of those techniques to investigate occupational and environmental exposures. He is particularly interested in the development of analytical methodology to measure xenobiotics and their metabolites or transformation products in biological samples or biomarkers. In support of these efforts, he conducts studies to develop sampling and analysis methods for environmental samples to provide accurate external exposure measures to validate those biomarkers. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the um, to the audience for for tuning in for uh, today's webinar. So, uh, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on some of the inhalational exposures that are experienced by cannabis workers, and potential respiratory health effects that may be associated with those exposures. I'll begin by sharing some general information on the current state of the cannabis industry here in the United States. I'll then provide a brief overview of the activities and the processes involved in cannabis cultivation and processing, highlighting in particular the potential inhalation exposures that may be present at these workplaces. And then finally, I'll present results from a study that we undertook at two indoor cannabis production and processing facilities in Washington State, where we measured airborne concentrations of potential uh, respiratory hazards, and we also conducted respiratory health measurements on the workers. So cannabis has, a long, has long been classified as an illegal drug in the United States. However, as illustrated on this slide, the legal status around cannabis has been becoming progressively more permissive. In 2012, Washington and Colorado became the first states in the union to legalize recreational use of marijuana. California then followed in 2016. Although cannabis is still considered illegal at the federal level, the trend of more permissive cannabis regulation at the state level has continued. So there are currently 33 states and four permanently inhabited US territories and the District of Columbia that have passed initiatives to legalize the medical and or the recreational use of cannabis. And those uh, jurisdictions include essentially the entire West Coast of the United States. Notably, commercial cultivation of hemp was also re recently legalized in the US at the federal level. Hemp is the same species as cannabis, 
the only difference being that hemp produces only low levels of tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, which is the main pharmacologically active component of cannabis. However, hemp workers are likely to share many of the occupational exposures experienced by cannabis workers. The attached graphic compares employment in the cannabis industry to several other familiar uh, occupations. Cannabis-related companies now employ over 100,000 full or part-time workers, and the industry is growing rapidly. As of October 2019, here in Washington State, over 1,100 producer licenses have been issued who produce together 200,000 pounds of marijuana flour per year and a total of 1.3 billion in total sales in the 2017 fiscal year. In 2018, here in Washington State, tax revenue from cannabis sales surpassed that from tobacco and alcohol. So this is a, a large and a growing industry. While the legal cannabis industry is still in its nascent stages, Growing cannabis is in fact nothing new. Widespread illegal cultivation of cannabis has occurred throughout the United States over many years. However, very little formal research has been conducted in regards to the hazards faced by cannabis farm workers. While some of the exposures may be unique to cannabis workers, many of these hazards are likely to be similar to those faced by other agricultural and horticultural workers. Thus, we can apply much of what we've learned from those related industries in order to protect cannabis workers. So I'll begin by um, providing an overview of some of the processes that are involved in the production and processing of cannabis. So cultivation typically begins by growing new plants from seed or more commonly propagating new plants from clippings taken from older plants that are then placed into a soil, into soil or a, a rooting hormone. Propagation from clippings preserves the genetic background of the parent plant and helps to ensure a consistent product. Conversely, cross-fertilization of plants from different genetic backgrounds with subsequent growth from seeds allows the cannabis farmer to select for specific desired traits. For example, high levels of the tetrahydrocannabinol, resistance to specific pests, or desirable flavor and aroma profiles. Breeding almost always takes place indoors under artificial lights in small containers. Potential occupational exposures at this stage of the process include UV emissions from the grow lamps, ergonomic hazards associated with repetitive motion and or awkward body positions, and potentially organic dust or molds and fungi that may be present growing on the crop. As the new plants grow, they are transferred to larger vessels and moved into different grow rooms or moved outdoors. Here in Washington State, cannabis is grown both indoors in warehouses, in shade houses, and outdoors. The life cycle of the cannabis plant is controlled by the light back cycle. In the natural environment, the shortening of days in the fall pushes the cannabis plant from its vegetative growth into its flowering stage. The flower, of course, is what is harvested and sold. Indoor grows can achieve three to four flowering cycles per year by artificially manipulating that light back cycle cycle. Uh, in contrast, outdoor grows only achieve a single flowering cycle per year, though typically outdoor grown plants are larger and produce more flower per plant compared to indoor plants. So this slide illustrates a number of, ex of examples of different grow environments. Uh, so on the, the top left, uh, we see a um, a shade house where the, the plants um, are uh, in pots sitting on the ground. Um, down below, there's a, a higher tech indoor facility where the plants are being grown uh, primarily under, under grow lights 
and you can see that the plants are packed close together on these uh, raised benches that are on wheels that can be moved around, allowing the workers to get access uh, in between the different rows of plants. Uh, the, the top right shows a, a small operation. Again, it looks like the, the plants are, um, are much lower down towards the ground, which would require the, the worker to, um, to bend over in order to, um, to, to do the plant maintenance activities. And you can see that in that facility, the, the worker would be uh, in very close proximity to the, the grow lamps. And then down in the bottom right is an example of um, an outdoor grow facility in Washington State. Uh, oftentimes those facilities will start with a um, plastic sheeting over the, the hoops that you can see uh, in that particular um, illustration. And uh, then as the, the season extends, the, the plastic sheeting is removed and the plants are, are growing exclusively under sunlight. So workers in these facilities undertake challenging physical labor. As I mentioned, some places have the plants on tables, which bring the plants up towards arm and eye height, whereas others have the plants on the floor, which requires more hunching and poor postural positions from the workers. Growers in Washington state are regulated based on canopy size. So they're only licensed to have a specific number of square feet of cannabis canopy. Maximizing canopy means keeping plants as, uh, as close together as possible, uh, as illustrated in the example on the bottom left, uh, which requires workers to squeeze into small and awkward areas between the plants with heavy items. And of course, this uh, high, high plant density also tends to provide a favorable environment for growth of pathogens, including, for example, mold and mildew. So the kind of occupational exposures that the workers would experience at this stage of the process include uh, ultraviolet light exposure, either from the grow lamps or from sunlight for the outdoor facilities, awkward body positions involving lifting and hunching when they're moving the plants around or tending to the plants, mold and mildew, uh, where that might be growing on the plants, they may be exposed to, to pesticides. Um, in Washington state, there are very strict regulations on the kinds of pesticides that are allowed to be used on cannabis plants. Uh, although initially when the industry was legalized, there was no testing required to ensure that uh, growers were conforming to the, um, the regulations in terms of which pesticides they could use. There's also the potential for workers to be exposed to particulate matter and organic dust. In the indoor facilities, oftentimes uh, elevated levels of carbon dioxide are pumped into the rooms in order to maximize vegetative growth. And as those of you who have been around cannabis will be aware, cannabis has a, a particularly pungent aroma. Those uh, those smells are coming from volatile organic compounds, um, primarily from terpenes. And so the workers uh, would be exposed to those terpenes. Terpenes are, are unsaturated hydrocarbons. They are what give the plant their aroma. Uh, so smells like lavender and pine and eucalyptus and hops, those scents are all the result of terpenes. Research on terpenes outside of the context of cannabis has shown that several of them may cause allergic respiratory and dermal reactions in some people. Conversely, there have been other studies that have suggested that terpenes may provide positive health benefits. The health consequences of exposure to terpenes in the context of cannabis cultivation and processing is largely unknown. So once the plants have reached the desired size, the flowers have set, uh, then uh, the, the harvest would take place. Uh, the, uh, the, the illustrations uh, show um, the, the buds that have been removed from the, the plants. The, the buds are then held, uh, hung up in drying rooms to allow them to dry. Um, after 
as they have dried to an adequate extent uh, that the, um, the buds are then usually moved into closed containers, uh, such as the, the plastic rubber maids illustrated here, which where the, the, the plants may then stay for several weeks or a month or so for the moisture to, <coughs> excuse me, to redistribute for the, the flowers to cure. So care needs to be taken uh, to adequately control the environment in the drying rooms, in particular to, uh, to prevent growth of mold. VOC exposures during the, the harvest can be particularly high. There's a lot of fresh plant material that is concentrated into a small space. And when the, the leaves are cut and damaged during the harvest, that promotes uh, release of the terpenes. You might imagine the release of the arom aromatic volatiles when you crush a mint leaf or your mint tea or your mojito. That, uh, that gives you a sense of the, the release of the volatile uh, aromatic terpenes during this harvesting process. After the, the flower has dried adequately, the dried flowers are then sorted and graded. The highest quality bud is trimmed by hand to remove the leaves and the stems. Uh, this process involves uh, a lot of repetitive motion and poor posture and may put workers at risk for uh, repetitive motion type injuries. The lower quality flower is mechanically trimmed and crushed to create a coarse powder and this coarse powder is then loaded into the uh, rolled joints an example of which is, is illustrated on the picture on this slide. You can see that the rolled joints in the, the top of the slide, uh, typically those would be packed using a machine called a knockbox, but then individual worker, workers would weigh each joint by hand and add additional, add or remove additional ground plant material in order to get just the correct weight of, uh, of cannabis into the joint. Higher exposures to coarse particles are likely uh, uh, during these, these tasks, um, specifically to organic dust and potentially to mold spores if those happen to be present in the cannabis. The coarse powder can also be extracted using hydrocarbon solvents or supercritical carbon dioxide in order to create concentrates that are enriched in THC and the other cannabinoids and these concentrates are then sold as waxes or as oils and may be used to infuse edibles. Workers engaged in the preparation of concentrates may be exposed to the, the solvents that are used to, um, to do the extractions and they may also be exposed to the highly concentrated cannabinoid extract. So that completes the brief overview of the processes and potential exposures involved in cannabis production. Now for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to focus specifically on inhalation exposure and potential respiratory effects in cannabis workers. We chose to focus on this specific topic because our initial interviews with cannabis workers and employers identified respiratory health as being a primary important concern amongst workers in this industry. And indeed, there have been several case reports of allergic airway disease associated with occupational exposure to Canada, cannabis. And a hazard alert highlighting the risk for asthma in cannabis workers was issued by the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries. Uh, that hazard alert is what's displayed on the screen at the moment. So the, the study that we undertook uh, took place at two cannabis producer processes in Washington State, both of whom grow cannabis indoors. So the first facility was a tier three indoor grow operation. Tier three is the largest size of producer in Washington State and they are licensed to grow up to 30,000 square feet of plant canopy. This particularly facil particular facility uses conventional non-organic farming methods. 
in addition to growing their own product, they seasonally purchase outdoor grown cannabis from other growers in Washington state, which they then process into consumer products, including the hand trimmed bud, the joints and uh, production of concentrates, which they then on sell to, um, to other producers to create edibles. This facility has a total workforce of uh, 45 workers, 31 of whom agreed to participate in the study. The second facility was a smaller facility. It was a tier two indoor grow uh, that uses organic pesticide free farming methods. Tier two is the intermediate size of, of grower in Washington state, and they are licensed to grow up to 10,000 square feet of plant canopy. This facility uh, only grew their own product. They did not import any outdoor grown product. Uh, their total workforce was 20 work workers of whom 11 participated in the study. At facility one, where most of our effort was focused, we undertook eight days of exposure measurement and four days per subject of, of health measurement, whereas at, at facility two, we only undertook a single day of exposure and health measurement. Our study design involved taking full shift area samples at four task zones within each facility. A priori, we had I hypothesized that the level of airborne contaminants and the mixture of contaminants present would differ between these task zones. The four task zones uh, illustrated on the slide here, uh, the grow rooms, the trim area where the flower, uh, flower is hand trimmed, the pre-roll area where the crushed flower is packed into those pre-roll joints, and the office area. The office area at each facility was separate from the other ta task zones and had its own separate uh, heating, ventilation, and cooling system. This area was selected as the reference location and was anticipated to have contaminant levels representative of that ambient indoor background concentrations. At facility number one, we did full shift sampling on Mondays and Fridays for four days in December and four days in January. Our sampling included uh, measurements of particulate matter using a continuous reading Dialus DC110 Pro optical particle counter. And this device um, counts particles in four size bins uh, between 0 0.5 to 10 microns. This information, uh, the particle number concentrations were calculated and then processed in order to determine or to estimate particle mass concentrations and particle size distribution. In addition, we, uh, we measured 21 uh, terpenes, 21 cannabis derived terpenes uh, in the indoor air at these facilities at the same locations that we were collecting the particle concentrations. We used uh, charcoal sorbent tubes to collect those terpenes, extracted the tubes, analyzed the extract using gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, and then summed the concentration of these 21 terpenes to, to generate a total VOC measure. In one or two locations, we also had a continuous reading photoionization detector that allowed us to um, evaluate the time series of um, total VOC concentrations. And as I mentioned, the, the uh, exposure monitoring took place over eight days at facility number one, but only a single day at facility number two. So I'll summarize uh, the results of those exposure measurements. Uh, the particle concentrations were similar at both facilities. And so the data from the two facilities were aggregated by task zone to generate the figure that's illustrated here. So uh, what we're here, seeing here is a box plot that illustrates the particle mass concentrations at each of the four task zones. 
Uh, the way to interpret these box plots is that the horizontal line in the middle of each box represents the median particle concentration. The upper and lower limits on each box represent the 25th and the 75th percentile. And then the, um, the hairs extending above and below each box extend out to the 5th percentile at the bottom and the 95th percentile at the top. And each of the individual data points is represented by an individual spot on this plot. So what we see is that the average particle concentrations were highest in the trim task area, illustrated uh, in purple on the left. Uh, those average concentrations were 60 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, concentrations were progressively lower in the pre-roll task area, the grow task area, um, and the concentrations in the grow task area were very similar to the office area, which was the reference zone, and that concentrations there were 27 micrograms per cubic meter. The particle concentrations in the trim area and the pre-roll area were significantly elevated compared to the reference area, but in general, for an occupational work workplace, we would consider these particle concentrations to be low. None of the samples uh, exceeded the uh, US OSHA time-weighted PEL for um, particles not otherwise regulated of 15 milligrams per cubic meter, nor did they exceed the ACGIH uh, TWA of 10 milligrams per cubic meter. We also assess differences in particle size distributions across the task zones within each facility. And as illustrated in the slide here, particle size distributions were pretty similar across all of the task zones. Ag again, aggregated across both facilities, the task area with the highest mass median aerodynamic air diameter was the trim area that had a, a value of uh, 3.76 micrometers <clears throat> uh, with slightly lower values for the pre-roll and the office area and lowest for the grow area. But those um, mean uh, aerodynamic diameters are all very close to each other. Results from this size distribution analysis were consistent with aerosol distributions of typical occupational settings. Uh, Ramachandran, for example, described occupational aerosols typically to be log normally distributed with geometric standard deviations ranging from 1.5 to 3.5. However, examples of mass median aerodynamic diameters and agricultural workplace settings um, including uh, included dairy barns, which had an MMAD of 13 micrometers. Samples from a grain facility um, also had a MMAD of about 13 micrometers, and uh, wheat dust had an MMAD of about 13 micrometers. So the particle sizes in, the, in these uh, cannabis grow facilities seem to be somewhat smaller than uh, what is often seen for outdoor agricultural workplaces where the, the, the particles are more into the, the coarse size fraction. Uh, this figure illustrates the terpene mass concentrations across the four task zones. And as we saw with particle mass concentrations, the trim task area has the highest terpene concentrations in this case, about 36 milligrams per cubic meter. And this was sig significantly higher than terpene concentrations measured in the office area with terpenes in the, in the pre-roll and the grow areas being intermediate between the trim and the office. Currently, the only occupational standards regarding terpene exposures uh, have been established for countries in the, in the EU, the European Union, 
And their eight hour time weighted average exposure standards range from between 20 to 100 part per million, which translates to approximately 50 to 200 milligrams per cubic meter. So our measurements were typically below 50 milligrams per cubic meter, so below that European standard. However, there were four samples that were greater than 50 milligrams per cubic meter and two samples that were greater than 100 milligrams per cubic meter. This uh, plot illustrates the correlation between particle mass concentration plotted on the x-axis versus the total uh, terpene mass concentration on the y-axis. And uh, we observed that there was a weak correlation between particle mass and total terpenes. However, when uh, the data was broken down into individual task zones, the associations between particle mass and two terpene mass were, were weak and were not statistically significant. So that indicates that there is uh, not an especially strong relationship between uh, the terpenes and the total particle mass concentration. So I'll next uh, move on to describe the health study and the health data that we collected. Um, so for the health study, as with the exposure monitoring, most of the effort was focused on a repeated measures design undertaken at facility number one. So um, we, at facility number one, we administered a baseline questionnaire regarding symptoms and work activities. And then on a subset of the workers who reported work-related symptoms, we then did a repeated measures uh, series of health measurements on those on 10 symptomatic workers at each facility. For facility number one, we repeated those measurements for four work shifts. For facility only uh, for number two, we only did the, the measurements for a single work shift. And those health measurements included pre and post shift spirometry, pre and post shift measures of exhaled nitric oxide, which is a measure of airway inflammation, and then one time only skin prick allergen testing uh, that included uh, four common Northwest allergens and two um, extracts of dried cannabis material from the faci facilities that we visited. And again, most of this effort focused on facility number one. Uh, we added a single day of the health measurements at facility number two in order to try and uh, evaluate the generalizability of our pilot observations from facility number one. Uh, so this slide illustrates the number of subjects involved at each stage of the study for facility number one. So the, the total work, for work Force at that facility numbered 45 individuals. We tried to recruit as many of those individuals as possible to participate in the phase one cross-sectional study. So that was the, uh, the, the health questionnaire. And 31 of the 45 workers agreed to participate in that study. We then reviewed their responses to the questionnaires and identified 10 workers uh, who reported uh, occupationally associated symptoms and those workers we recruited into the phase two study that involved the measurements of, of, of spirometry, so lung function, airway inflammation, and the skin prick testing. So this gives you a sense of how we defined uh, work-related respiratory symptoms. Um, so any worker that uh, reported a symptom that occurred at work or that exposure at work made their symptoms worse or they reported that their symptoms improved when they were away from work. Any one of those three uh, classifications uh, we lumped together as our definition of a work-related symptom for the purposes of this analysis. Uh, this slide summarizes the um, health measurements that we made. 
our definition of abnormal response to the health measures is based on Amer American Thoracic Society criteria. So for uh, airway inflammation, the exhaled nitric oxide, anything less than 25 part per billion was considered normal. 25 to 50 part per billion was considered borderline and greater than 50 part per, per billion was considered um, high or elevated. In the case of spirometry, um, less than 70% of normal uh, was, uh, was considered abnormal for the FEV1 to FVC ratio, or less than 80% or 0.8 of normal was considered abnormal for the FEV1 and the FVC. And then for the skin prick testing, which we did one time only on each of these workers, uh, we tested four types of mold ex extract, including Helminthosporium, Alternaria, Penicillium, and Aspergillus. And then we prepared cannabis slurries for two strains of cannabis that were grown at each facility. For each strain, a mixture of leaves and flowers was ground to make a, a fine powder, which there was then mixed with one to two mil of sterilized saline. That extract was then filtered, and it was that filtered extract that was pricked onto the subject's skin uh, for this test. We also had um, a positive control um, which was uh, histamine and a negative control, which was the saline. So moving on to summarizing the health results. So this slide illustrates the participant uh, characteristics, typical of workers in the cannabis industry in Western Washington. Um, most of the workers are Caucasian, uh, a, a mix of men and women. Also typical of workers, of cannabis workers uh, in Western Washington, there was a high prevalence of uh, cannabis use amongst the workers, uh, a very high prevalence. So 97% of the, the workers at facility number one and 100% at facility number two reported that they used cannabis. And as illustrated on this next slide, uh, they they used it regularly, primarily by smoking, though uh, sometimes by other methods as well. And they used it um, multiple times per day. It's worth noting that uh, law in Washington state prohibits workers from using cannabis on site at a cannabis uh, production or processing facility. And so, um, if th these workers would not have been able to use cannabis during their work shift, but they may have been able to use it off-site during their, their lunch break, or of course, before or after their work shift. So based on responses to the symptom questionnaire, work-related respiratory symptoms were the most common, as illustrated in these plots. Uh, more than two-thirds of workers at each facility reported the use of respiratory symptoms that either occurred at, worse, uh, at work, got worse at work, or got better when the subjects were away from work. Dermal symptoms were the least frequently reported. So this is a very high prevalence of work-related respiratory symptoms amongst these workers. So a priori, we had hypothesized that we might see acute reversible changes in lung function and airway inflammation in response to exposures to cannabis at work. So therefore, we evaluated the cross-shift and cross-week changes in these health measurements. We would expect to see increases in exhaled nitric oxide, meaning more inflammation, and decreases in FEV1 and FVC, meaning reduced lung function as a consequence of these exposures. So we did see a modest cross-week increase in exhaled nitric oxide in the hypothesized direction, but not for the cross-shift measure. We also saw modest, but not statistically significant cross-shift and cross-week decreases in FEV1 and, and FVC. Overall, I would classify this data as showing not strong evidence 
for short-term changes in lung function and airway inflammation associated with cannabis exposure. In general, what we did see is that abnormalities in airway inflammation or lung function were persistent. So that if a, test, a worker had elevated airway inflammation at one point during the study, it was typically elevated for all of their time points, both pre and post shift and also beginning and end of week. So this slide illustrates the results from the health outcomes on the 10 workers at each facility. A purple box in the table indicates that the worker's measurement was abnormal. A hatched box indicates borderline elevation and exhaled nitric oxide. So overall, we can see that facility one had a much higher prevalence of impaired respiratory health and cannabis sensitization amongst the 10 workers that we tested. Five of the 10 participants had abnormal or borderline elevated exhaled nitric oxide, which indicates airway inflammation compared to um, only three of the 10 workers showing abnormal FENO at facility number two. Seven of the 10 workers had uh, an abnormal lung function at facility number one compared to only two of the 10 workers at facility number two. And five of the 10 workers at facility number one exhibited an allergic sensitization to one or other of the two cannabis strains tested in the skin prick assay. In comparison, only two of the 10 workers at facility number two had a positive reaction to the cannabis skin prick test. And for comparison, zero of five UW research scientists exhibited allergic sensitization to cannabis. So in conclusion, uh, we observed a relatively high prevalence of work-related allergic symptoms, especially respiratory symptoms reported by the cannabis workers. This was the first study of immunologically mediated response to cannabis amongst cannabis farm workers. And we observed, especially at one of the two facilities, a high prevalence of cannabis sensitization, a high, a high prevalence of airway inflammation and impaired lung function. Remembering that this is amongst employees who had indicated that they had work-related symptoms based on the baseline health questionnaire. Uh, an important caveat is that these conclusions are limited by the small sample size and especially by confounding from the re ubiquitous recreational cannabis use amongst these employees. Uh, those caveats notwithstanding, the relatively high prevalence of the work-related symptoms, together with respiratory disease and also the cannabis sensitization in these workers, suggests that occupational exposures may be either causing or exacerbating respiratory symptoms in these workers, despite the fact that the measured exposures were well below the PELs. Uh, we would suggest that workplaces consider adopting the ACGAH TLV for cotton dust um, as an interim um, measure in the absence of a, a cannabis specific permissible exposure limit. And we also encourage cannabis workplaces to consider implementing exposure controls for tasks that generated high levels of dust. So for example, the, uh, the knock box, which was the device that vibrated the ground cannabis into those uh, pre-rolled joints. And ideally that exposure control would be an, an engineering control such as an enclosure around the process or installation of local exhaust ventilation. Okay, so this closes uh, the, um, uh, the prepared presentation and I'll turn things back over to the moderator to uh, manage the question piece of the presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to enter it into the online chat or Q&A box.
Um, one of our first questions, someone was curious to find out if there are any respiratory issues with cannabis translating to the propagation of hemp, as that's an emerging crop being grown in New York. So that's an, uh, an excellent question. And in fact, uh, given that hemp has been uh, legal for cultivation in other countries uh, outside of the US for a number of years, there actually is some existing literature on, um, on uh, respiratory disease amongst hemp workers. And that literature does um, point to higher prevalence of respiratory disease, including uh, in some cases chronic bisonosis. Um, amongst hemp workers who are exposed to organic dust from hemp production. Thank you. Um, we also have another question. Um, does cannabis grow indoors for medical purposes, for example, in warehouses under artificial lighting, constitute an agricultural crop and enterprise? Um, this question comes from someone who wonders, as this industry expands, if addressing the issues of safety are going to fall under the work of agricultural centers or into other occupational categories. Yeah, so that's also a, a very interesting question, and it has uh, something of a complicated answer. So, of course, um, cannabis is a, a, it's illegal at the federal level and therefore is not uh, considered federally to be an agricultural crop. Um, individual states have their own regulations uh, regarding designation of, of different crops. So here in, in Washington State, for example, um, our um, department, State Department of Labor and Industries um, uses agricultural health and safety regulations to regulate um, the production or the growing of cannabis. However, our State Department of Agriculture uh, thus far does not uh, formally consider cannabis to be an agricultural crop from their perspective. As far as uh, the, the, the NIOSH Ag Centers are concerned, um, informally, I, I think that uh, that program recognizes the similarity between cannabis, so cannabis growing and other forms of agriculture. And so some of the Ag Centers have um, funded pilot projects, including supporting the, the, the project that I described to you today. Um, looking at the occupational health uh, concerns for workers in this industry. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have another question. Did pesticides versus the organic facility have any influence on the conclusions of your study? Uh, <clears throat> so there were, um, there were a number of possible um, differences between the, the two facilities that, that we looked at that could be associated with uh, uh, <clears throat> apparently higher prevalence of, of health concerns that we saw in the, um, in the first facility. So as I mentioned up, my, up front, uh, Washington State is really pretty restrictive in terms of the, um, the pesticides that are allowed to be used on cannabis crops. Uh, the most highly toxic pesticides cannot be used on cannabis. And uh, from my observations um, and uh, the fact that facility number one allowed our research time to come on site, uh, we're pretty confident that they were following the, the state regulations and were not, um, were not using highly toxic pesticides as part of their, their process. Uh, so it's, um, I consider it less likely that pesticide exposure was um, a significant worker concern at, at that facility. Uh, I think one thing that is an important difference between those facilities is that facility number one imported a lot of, uh, of outdoor grown product um, from other growers, uh, primarily in Eastern Washington. And so the, um, the quality of that product is not, as, uh, not necessarily as um, well managed as the quality of the, the indoor grown product. Uh, there was certainly the a higher potential for a present of um, mold and mildew and things like that associated with the outdoor grown product that was then processed at facility number, number one. 
So, um, and, and then the fact that there was simply a higher volume of material being processed at facility number one compared to facility number two. So a number of possibilities why the, the exposures uh, may have been different at facility number one and why the, uh, the, um, the health effects that we observed at facility number one were more prevalent compared to facility number two. Thank you. Um, we also have another question regarding what precautions did you need to take to protect you and the other researchers while you were competing the field studies? Uh, so the, um, most of the precautions that the science team took were, um, were, were uh, requested of us by the facility owners who were um, very keen to make sure that we didn't contaminate their crop. And so we, we wore um, typical laboratory PPE. We had uh, lab coats, laundered lab coats that were provided by the facilities. Uh, when we went into the indoor grow areas where we were wearing uh, UV protective um, goggles to, to protect our eyes. Um, we did not handle um, the crop at all. Uh, workers that were handling the crop typically used um, nitrile gloves, uh, both to protect themselves from the crop, but also to protect the crop from um, contamination by the workers. Thank you. This actually ties into another question. Um, what, was there any required use of PPE by workers and specifically respirators? Uh, so there was not requ required use of respirators at either of the facilities that I described here, uh, nor at, um, at any of the other facilities that, that I visited in Washington State, uh, with the, I think with the one exception of uh, some of the facilities that uh, when they applied pesticide required respirator use. In general, what we saw was that um, all facilities um, offered voluntary use of um, either dust masks, sometimes N95 uh, half face respirators, and in some cases facilities had full face elastomeric respirators for use with uh, um, the activities that generated high levels of particles. Unfortunately, there was nothing that would constitute a proper respiratory protection program. So the employers were providing the equipment, but they were not necessarily aware of the requirement to do fit testing. Um, they, they were not aware of a requirement to clean the um, the masks and the respirators after they were used, they were used, and oftentimes we saw workers using scarves and bandanas and things like that tied around their noses, uh, which would not constitute effective respiratory protection. Thank you. Um, another kind of tying into this question here, um, what about engineering controls? Did you observe any LEV or containment hoods being used? Uh, so we did not observe uh, any LEV for the uh, facilities that we visited. Um, there were two specific processes. One is the knock box that I described. There's another uh, process that involves sifting the, the intact flour and large Rubbermaid containers. And both of those we, uh, we suggested to the facilities that they uh, consider and closing those processes and installing local ex exhaust ventilation for those tasks. And at least one of the facilities was um, was enthusiastic in principle to, to pursue that, though I, uh, to my knowledge, they haven't necessarily moved forward with it as yet. Thank you. Um, we also have some questions related to terp turpentines. Terpentines? <laughs> I'm not saying that correctly. <laughs> Um, you mentioned that your team mentioned terpenes in aggregate. Have you considered measuring individual terpenes at each state of production? Um, and if so, which would you expect to be the most abundant? Yeah, so, so actually our terpene measurement, um, it quantifies each of uh, 21 individual compounds. Uh, for simplicity, I aggregated all of the data as a total measure. 
uh, during this talk, but we do have that data broken down by compound. Uh, in the facilities that we visited, there were really two or three compounds that were most abundant, if I remember right. Um, beta mercine was one of those, uh, limonene was another one, and maybe osamine was, was um, the, the third. Um, we, uh, so that the concentrations absolutely were highest in the dry room during the harvesting process. Um, and then uh, the, um, they were somewhat lower in the, um, in the trim area and the grow area. A priori, we might have guessed that uh, they might be higher in the, the grow area where you've got um, uh, a dense congregation of the, the green plant, um, but there were still uh, significant levels in the, the, uh, the trim area where the workers were, um, were dealing with uh, dried product, but still relatively fresh dried product. I think the, the fact that we saw a, a poor correlation between particle mass correlation and terpene concentrations uh, suggests that uh, with a larger study, then, then uh, maybe the possibility to tease apart those two um, uh, sources of exposure, if you like, um, and, and get a sense of how they might differ for different task types. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you did aggregate the, the results here. Is there a way for our listeners to see how those um, terpenes broken out in their relative amounts from your study? Uh, yeah, I could probably put together one or two slides that, that showed what the typical uh, terpene profiles look like. Um, they, were, they were broadly similar across the different um, locations and so uh, that was why we hadn't um, pursued trying to do in-depth analysis on the, the individual compounds. Great, thank you so much. Um, we have plenty more questions, so thank you everyone so much for your engagement and entering in questions for us here today. Um, someone else was wondering about the demographic info of the workers, if you're able to speak to that. Yeah, so um, we found that that varies regionally here in Washington State. So um, as I mentioned out on the, uh, the, the west part of the state, uh, the kind of the Seattle, uh, Puget Sound area, um, the work workforce tends to be relatively young, um, predominantly Caucasian. Um, in, in Eastern Washington, where a lot of the outdoor grows um, are located, and that's an area where most of the outdoor agriculture takes place in Washington State, we have a very large um, Hispanic um, agricultural workforce. And, uh, and we noticed, we observed that in some of the outdoor cannabis grows there, um, there was um, a higher proportion of Hispanic workers um, at those facilities and anecdotally a lower prevalence of cannabis use amongst those workers. Thank you. Um, we have another question about um, the medicated edible space. If workers are exposed to cannabis distillate through making edibles, such as a medicated dust, are there any respiratory exposure concerns that you're aware of? Uh, so the, um, the, typically the way that that process works is that the, the dust itself um, is extracted now using closed cycle extraction equipment, uh, the, the organic extract is, is then concentrated. And at that point, uh, the concentrate um, is, is very oily or viscous in nature. Uh, and so once you get to the point of the, the concentrate, um, there's less of a risk for, um, for particle exposures. Uh, the cannabinoids themselves if they're not heated and not especially volatile. So I think the, um, once you get to the, the stage of the concentrated extract, perhaps the bigger concern there is potential dermal exposure to that, that concentrate uh, and less of a concern with the, um, the inhalation exposures. Thank you. 
Um, we also have another question from um, someone at the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Um, towards the end of the presentation, you mentioned that exposure was short term. Um, what do you mean by that? Are you able to expand? Um, it's, their interpretation is that year round production is with full time permanent workers. So any clarification you're able to offer there would be welcome. Yes, I, I, uh, I think what I said, what I meant to say was that we had initially expected that um, that the health effects would be short term and um, and transient in, in nature so similar to um, uh, someone who is exposed to an allergen uh, they have a typically they will have a um, a relatively rapid onset reaction and then uh, those symptoms will resolve when they're away from work. And so if the time course is rapid enough, they would resolve overnight. And so you would have the, the worker feeling worse during the day at work, but feeling better at night. Or if the time course is a little bit longer, you might expect the symptoms to resolve during the weekend, but persist during the week. Um, that's what we had guessed uh, uh, initially, but... Um, as I, as I mentioned, the most severe symptoms that we saw in terms of the airway inflammation and the, um, and the impaired lung function, our observations were that those were chronic in nature. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the time course of the exposures themselves, um, for workers in indoor grow facilities, yeah, those uh, those facilities are constantly harvesting, processing um, new material and so on. So those exposures occur year round. For the outdoor workers, uh, the exposures are much more seasonal. And so during the growing season, um, typically from say March and March through until the, till September, uh, the workers would be exposed to the green plant as it grows in size. Uh, then the crop is harvested typically over the space of about a month or so. And a lot of that, that crop is then um, dried and processed into joints and so on uh, during a relatively intense period. So there's much more seasonality to the exposures for the outdoor workers than there is for the indoor workers. Great, thank you. Um, another exposure that um, someone in Canada has been invest thinking about investigating is radon in cannabis facilities, given that groundwater may be used in cultivation in some high radon potential areas. Um, is this something to consider in Washington as well? Uh, so that's, that's not something that, uh, that we have thought about specifically. Um, I'm, I'm not, um, I don't have a lot of expertise in, in radon. I'm, uh, I'm not even sure <laughs> the extent to which uh, Washington is a, a risk area for, for high levels of, of ground level radon. So that's something that I would, I would have to uh, look into. Um, in general, these, um, uh, well, some of these facilities are pretty well ventilated to try and move the moisture through the facilities. Uh, and so for the ones that are well ventilated, I would not anticipate um, accumulation of high levels of radon gas. Some of the indoor facilities uh, may be less well ventilated um, because, uh, in part because of odor regulations that uh, prohibit them from releasing cannabis odors to the outdoors. And so those, that those indoor facilities, there's uh, likely to be more recycling of the air indoors. And if there were uh, migration of, of radon into those facilities. Uh, potentially those would be the ones that would be at risk. Great, thank you. Um, and we are reaching the end of our time here. Um, we do have an, one last question that I'd like to pose um, before we close. Um, someone was curious about um, personnel data seemed to show previous asthma and allergy symptoms. Do you believe that cannabis sent sensitization might exacerbate underlying symptoms of asthma and allergy? Uh, that's certainly a possibility. It um, turns out to be a, a complicated workforce. So given that so many of the workers uh, were smoking cannabis and presumably had been smoking cannabis um, 
for a, a long period of time before they entered into the workforce. Uh, with this particular population, it's a little bit tricky to disentangle <clears throat> the extent to which the workplace uh, or their personal use may have exacerbated their, symptoms, their, their sense, sensitivity to exposures at work versus their exposures at work um, kind of exacerbating uh, symptoms in association with their personal use. So certainly for, uh, for studies in the future, um, we would have to look at trying to identify groups of populations that, uh, that either were not occupationally exposed and also groups that were occupationally exposed but did not use cannabis recreationally so that we could try and disentangle those two effects. Well, thank you so much for your time and answering all of these questions. Um, a special thank you to you, Dr. Simpson, as well as everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Um, the NIOSH Education and Research Center Industrial Hygiene Webinar Series takes place the second Tuesday of every month. This new series is in addition to our NIOSH ERC Ergonomics Webinar Series, which takes place the third Wednesday of each month. Um, also, if you're interested in this topic, we've also partnered with CCRON to offer a webinar on updates on medical cannabis science and therapeutics, and that webinar will be on March 19th, presented by Dr. Doug Benner. Thank you so much, and be sure to check out our website for more information and to register for upcoming events at coeh.berkeley.edu slash about CE. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks.